before we get started on the first part of the video, I want to show you a quick piece to clarify that all issues demonstrated in the video have been resolved, and the Mac is, to my knowledge, completely working. Hovering does not send you tipping past the point of balance. The laser sight is now toggle-based, and some other stuff about toggles as well, and dashing is no longer bugged beyond all belief. So, yeah. <clears throat> Based off all that, uh... Well, with no uh, further ado, let's start the show. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. This is part one of our tutorial for how to use the big dreadnought on the uh, Steam Workshop for the game Machine Craft. In all likelihood, you have been linked to this due to a comment I placed upon the Workshop page. If so, I'm glad you have found it. I know it's a little unconventional, but I feel both of these videos are important, and the first of these, the one we're doing right now, I believe is the most important. All too often I see many people enter games with workshop machines and they find they don't know how to use the machine and the controls that they're given, while sometimes simplified or made more clear, as I attempt to do, uh, aren't always crystal clear and there's a lot of how to use. Um, so our second video, if you're interested in that, is going to be how to customize the Dreadnought according to its vast plethora of modular parts. For now, we're going to go into play mode here and we're going to run down the list of controls, which is exactly one page of controls, or in all probability, probably about 16 to 32 different control inputs. Alright, let's go and do our transition here. Now, we're cheating, we're keeping our uh, how to use menu open, so we're going to go through these one at a time for maximum clarity and simplicity. W will move you forward, as you probably would have guessed. S will move you backward, as you... Oh, interesting. I appear to have a slight bug. We're going to work that before we release it, don't worry. Now, to turn left, we will use A, and to turn right, we will use D. The turning is alright, but it's very fast when you're moving. Uh, in fact, it's so fast, this is actually one of the more maneuverable types of bots you can find without overdosing on turn rate. Uh, we have a jump pack installed that also has a jet pack mode. Uh, we can demonstrate that briefly with a spacebar tap, which will send us flying crazy far into the stratosphere because this thing is massively powerful. Uh, the original wasn't quite as powerful in intention, but, uh, let's fight say stuff happened. Um, this is the larger version, which is roughly 3.25 times scale, uh, in total volume, that is, per each axis, it is one and a half times the size of the original dread Dreadnought, which I have not released to the workshop. And I probably will not, as this is all around superior in my eyes. Now, uh, however, uh, moving on here, we, uh, do a bit of overdose on that, so if you're gonna use that, you can just tap it once, and you'll probably be sent plenty flying. You can also hold it to continue flying if, for some theoretical reason, you want to do that to get out of, say, water or something, as jetpacks do have reduced effectiveness inside the water. Next, we will demonstrate we have a descend button with left shift. When on the ground, this will also make you duck with no conceivable penalty. In case you want to keep a short stature and just add a bit of personality to how you're piloting the bot, the descend button is quite handy. Uh, we have a dash backwards key, which I guess actually does work. Well, I'm personally impressed. Because uh, we did mess up our backward uh, control temporarily here. And by using S and F in combination, you can dash backwards very quickly. We also have a forward control we'll get to in just a moment. To ascend in hover mode, which is a very slight amount of flight, you can hold H. We are currently tipping over. This is interesting. I don't believe I've changed in any significant way that would cause this, so I'm going to look into this in uh, probably just a moment, chances are. Now, uh, moving on, we have the uh, Disable Automatic Fire. This is done with E and can be indicated with a yellow light on the back of the jetpack. In summary, when the machine is fired, it will attempt to auto-aim relative to left and right position of the mouse. If you are sitting down in, say, a team battle game, you just want to wail on a target and not waste energy reserves on aiming, or at least not aiming side to side, as that is a relatively intensive process for this machine, you can do that and just blast loads and crap out of something all you want, quite frankly. It'll make you get a bit more bang for your buck. So if you're sitting there wailing on an objective for 12 hours or whatever, it's a good way to go about it. Now, uh, on top of that, we have the normal dash. Yes, I really should have mentioned that much sooner, but oh well. Uh, now, the most important part, next, arguably in my opinion, if you want to use this as intended, do you forgive my custom crosshairs, that is a bit weird. Uh, we have optics button, which is, say, the first-person camera. You can toggle this with middle mouse. Uh, toggling between first and third person to be very specific here. The camera is adjusted to have a pretty good amount of sensitivity to it, so you don't have to do a lot of budging around. 
it's pretty convenient by most respects. Uh, we have a headlamp feature that is 100% vanity, but I kept it for pure SNG's factor. I push it with L, and it kind of is off to a weird offset on the large version. I uh, assure you it worked better on the small version, but it's mostly just a sort of immersion slash decorative feature. Truth be told, I don't think anyone will use it, but hey, it's there for authenticity. Uh, for our uh, left weapon, we'll be using our mouse 1, or the left mouse as it's known. Accordingly, middle mouse is mouse 3, and right mouse is mouse 2, in case you were not aware. Now, by default, uh, we have a missile launcher here, and our control is not toggle-based, meaning we'll have to hold down to actually fire missiles. Doing so, we'll engage the left laser accordingly. It will do that even if it's green. However, red is generally used for missiles, as uh, it only activates when using the fire key, and not just when you're holding down the laser sight. Now, uh, to continue on... Uh, so that was our optic. Oh, sorry, 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 my bad. That was uh, the left gun. Next up, we have green laser key, which is R. Uh, this is a toggle. Uh, and then on the right hand, we have our right weapon, which in this case is by default a twin linked cannon, which is essentially a shotgun at this phase, firing four projectiles. Uh, if you want something a little more full auto with the same tank gun type effect to penetrate through personal shields, I recommend you check out the storm bolter weapon, which we will cover in the second video. Now, moving on, uh, we have chainswords we can activate with two. We only have one chainsword equipped, however, you can equip chainsword on either arm or even both. This is entirely at your own discretion and will, once again, be covered in our second video. Pushing two, we can see that it has a bright uh, quadruple strength center blade and four spinning blades it uses to kind of increase the range and add a bit of flair to it. It may also slightly increase the effectiveness of the individual blades, but it's hard to tell given the low RPM of the spinning blade. Now, next we have the personal shields button, which is, well, it's just used to absorb small arms fire. This primarily absorbs beamer rounds, possibly slight reduction to missiles and tank guns, and also stops uh, straight up normal bullet rounds. This is a triple layer shield, so it's quite bright. In summary, it can take about, probably about three small caliber projectiles before breaking. I'm not sure how it's calculated with beamers, but in short, this is used to... Uh, as a method to kind of just absorb some small arms fire. This is also a toggle, so if you're fighting someone with a tank gun or missiles or something like that, swords, let's say, you might want to not use a shield. But if you run into someone using tank guns or, or I mean, normal cannons that shoot bullets or beamers quite a lot, you can probably bet your bottom dollar personal shield will save your life. If nothing else, just long enough to close them with a dash attack and give them some chain sorting. My personal favorite moves, although I will say, due to the speed modification this game underwent a few patches ago, such a dash and melee combo is quite suicidal, so use it at your own discretion, or not at all if that's just your style. Up next we have the sort of social feature of, by pushing number pad 5, you can lock the weapons on the machine. I have forgotten to set many of these controls to toggles as I am quickly learning, but uh, in short, the red light means that it's no longer moving up or down, that's just to stop it from jittering in base position, which is related to the complex assembly of the machine. Uh, and really doesn't affect its ballistic properties by any means. Next, we have the head weapon, which is uh, always a toggle, and I recommend using a toggle. We have mortars, which you probably want to spam a lot if you even use them at all. They're mostly just kind of a why not. Uh, we have missiles, which are almost always a toggle in my preference book. And for third, we have a sort of head array of tank guns, in case you just want to penetrate armor with your head gun. Uh, however, that weapon tends to be quite costly and also accelerate its firing for cost-based reasons, as I understand it. So, based on that, uh, I, I'm okay with using a toggle for that, but it's usually uh, the number one, non-number pad version, to uh, toggle it. We can just drop bombardment all over the place. And uh, after that, we finally have auto-aim, which is numpad zero. Now, a quick word of advice, when you hold either fire button, you will have the machine actually recenter itself according to your aim. Uh, I can demonstrate this briefly. You just walk around a lot, you'll notice this happens some places more than others. In fact, I am totally failing demonstrating this at the moment. Yeah, yeah, now it's working for whatever reason, I think. I, I don't know, but... That's what I say is... Oh, my bad. We still have disable auto aim on. This explains everything. Yeah, so now we're going to pivot when we're firing a weapon because it wants to auto aim left and right when you're firing a weapon. So work with either weapon, but will not work with the head weapon, so keep that in mind. 
And uh, as a major note, we turn the entire machine using an automatic gyroscope. So this is toggled manually with the numpad in case you want to have consistent level of aim. And you don't find the turn rate is quite snappy enough for what you're trying to shoot, or perhaps not quite precise enough. Now, generally, if you're just going full auto on someone, being able to just aim while you're moving and do a bit of turning to compensate quicker might be all you need for combat. In fact, that's what I personally do almost 100% of the time. But in case you are one of those guys that likes a nice ease of use and you have a spare energy budget lying around, you can just keep this thing on all day and uh, walk around and let your mouse do all the hard work. So based on that, that covers our entire manual usage. Thanks for tuning in and I think you should very much check out the second video as it is very important for accessing the modular features of the Dreadnought, which is, in my opinion, one of the most powerful aspects. Until next time, WCCC signing out.